There's a global pitch happening and it's pushing private investors to allocate more to illiquid assets. It's very successful and it's shifting the whole investment landscape, but it could be based on a massive misunderstanding or even mis-selling. Yet it's using basic principles that investors know and love, returns and compounding. I'll explain how it's happening and how not to be fooled. My name is George. I'm a reform banker who's now deconstructing the marketing tricks of the financial industry. Compounding is a beautiful thing. Do you realize that if you invest just a thousand pounds today and you compound it at 26% for 30 years, you'll become a millionaire? But if I presented you with a new investment opportunity, like an asset class that suddenly opens up to you, what kind of return would make you interested? Of course, you know the disclaimer about past performance. It doesn't guarantee future results. But still, you'd want to know how much you would have made by investing in the past. And obviously, if I'm trying to sell it to you, I'll show that the asset class provides a huge return on average, something much better than equity markets. Huge upside potential with very little downside risk. Does that ring a bell? For example, in the S&P 500 for the last 35 years, we know we've compounded at 9.2%. It's pretty darn good. You're doubling your money about every eight years. But you've got 14.2%, not with these guys, with average private equity. And that return number will influence your investment decisions and that of millions of others in your situation. This is not a theoretical example. We're talking about private equity and trillions of inflows. It used to be for large institutional investors now. They become more accessible, but are they accessible? Yeah, well, that, those are two good questions. So the first one is the rules have changed. Oh, well, they're beginning to change. Right now, it used to be 1% of the population could get access as an accredited investor, for example. Million dollar net worth not counting their house. That retail investors are the biggest source of growth for the industry. And a clear priority, for example, for Blackstone. Today, it's 20% of households. If we look at Tony's number of 14%, it seems confirmed by other sources, such as Cambridge Associates, and these numbers are indeed pretty low compared to what the big guys show. So for KKR, it's 26% over 48 years. For Apollo, it's 39%. And they've been going for 34 years. Although this is a number, gross of fees, net of fees is 24%. If we compound these, we get spectacular numbers. Uh, for Apollo, a million invested at the origin would be 1.5 billion today. For KKR, I just look at the gross number. If we had invested a million 48 years ago, compounded that 26%, it would be 65 billions today. But if I look at Tony's numbers, as an example, if you had a million bucks and you put it aside in the S&P 35 years ago, forgot about it, it's worth 26 million. Take the same million, same 35 years, put in private equity, average private equity, it's $139 million. I don't get exactly the same returns, I get 100 million at 14.2 and about 22 at 9.2%. Maybe a slight mistake there. He was on live TV. But in any case, you get the idea right. With a few percent more per year, you can get an amount that's many times more after 35 years. So that is Tony's pitch and also the pitch that started at the beginning. Of course, we'd have to discuss about other things, liquidity, risk, etc. But really, when the performance is that impressive, the rest is all detail. Now, what if I told you this is wrong? This is not true. No one who's invested a million in Apollo and left their money there the whole time has gotten 1.5 billion. No one could put a million in the average private equity fund and get a hundred million today. Then you'd probably say, but hey, it's not there. And then how can I trick you? Because there are regulations that tell you what I'm supposed to do. The trick is simple. I spoke to you about compound, and then I used return figures for the private equity industries, but those returns are internal rate of returns, IRR. There is return in the name, so I think we can shorten it, but it's not an annual return. It's not a CAGR or compounded annual growth rate. It's not the same return that you can see in the equity market where indeed I could have bought a, a fund indexed on the S&P 500 35 years ago and get that return 35 years later. When you put them both on the same chart, one is investable and one is not. And it's data manipulation. The problem 
is the IRR has an easy name, a fairly intuitive definition if you know a bit of maths, it's the discount rate that makes the net present value of a project zero. I think this is understandable, but in practice it's impossible to calculate with a pen of paper. Okay, maybe it's possible, but it's very hard. It's an iterative process, but it's easy with a spreadsheet, so I've made one. And I'll share the link in the description. And you can see a few very basic examples. Consider these are all funds. But the first one is a sort of bond. This coupon is 10%, the IRR is 10%. And actually, that's the average case when the IRR is the same as the annual return. It's when it's paid every year or only paid at the end. If I compound 10% and invest for 10 years, I get 259. It's my IRR and my rate of return. But as soon as I mix up the flows, it becomes more complicated. And my next example is the Orama Automotive Strategy Fund, because it's a garage. We buy cars from a manufacturer, we sell them with a markup, and every year we service the car for a small fee. Those are the flows, and it gives us an IRR of 10 again. Whereas the net flows and the total value to pay it in are much smaller than in the first example. If I look at something that looks a little bit more like a private equity fund, I look at this enhanced private income strategy fund. No, in private equity, you don't pay everything up front. You commit to a certain amount of capital, and then it's called in the first part of the life of the fund and pays them as the firm exits the investment. And here we have total flows that are the same as my bond fund, but an IRR of 21%. And if I want to boost this further, I can borrow a bit and give it back to my investors in year one. But that will lower my total payout to investors, but that will increase significantly my RRR, which if you invest based on that, makes it a lot more attractive proposition. If you ask professional LPs who regularly invest in private equity, they'll probably say that they know the trick. They're not looking at the IRR. They are using other measures such as the MOIC, multiple or invested capital, the public market equivalent, TPIs, TPVIs. It's all very complicated and generally don't even appear in the brochures. Private equity firms just announced this is our IRR. And where Tony has crossed the line is that he has compounded it on TV. Well, if you had a million bucks and you put it aside in the S&P 35 years ago, forgot about it, it's worth 26 million. Take the same million, same 35 years, put in private equity, average private equity, it's $139 million. But no one has corrected Tony because the IRR is something that even most professionals in the financial industry get confused about. Of course, respectable private equity firms will never say they do that. But in phone calls, their salespeople are regularly using the since inception IRR as a rate of return. So for 2022, for the first three quarters, our Vintage Fund 9 was up 23% when the S&P, as we all know, was down 25%. And I have been given such a conversation. I'm taking notes here. Tell me again. So in 2022, your Vintage 9, which is Latest on the right side of this page, was up 23% for the year while the S&P was down. Wow. And that's the I yours is a 22% IRR, correct? Right. That was the actual return. That's your return profile. So 23% for the first three quarters of 2022. Okay. So that means if someone had $100 in January, they'd have $123 with you, but they'd have 75 with the market. Correct. So if you follow what I've said so far, clearly this IRR of 23% cannot be compared to the loss of 25% on the equity this year. The IRR provides no information on the actual flows and it can be very easily manipulated. And it's showing an inflated figure compared to what we'd expect as actual annual returns. And it definitely cannot be compounded. That makes it a very inappropriate return ratio, but a very good marketing tool if you can confuse people that it's a natural return and you can slap it on all the brochures for private investors. At the end of the day, the private equity industry sells themselves on past performance. And if that's not there, then they are in trouble. So past performance is a carte blanche for them to do whatever they want. And so if you defeat them on that, if you say this is not as clear as what you make it sound, 
they get very upset. And lots of people get very upset because their livelihood depends on that statistic. So how do you handle that as an investor interested in private equity and private markets in general? First, well, of course, you've got to be careful of the data. If it's called IRR, you might as well dismiss it completely. Generally speaking, just be skeptic if the returns are a lot higher than public stock markets for a long time, it's more likely that there is data manipulation than that you found a gem that no one else was aware of. And if you want to explore further on private equity, I've got a lot of resources for you. There's a video about the marketing of Blackstone. There are podcast conversation, including your professor Falipu. There's also my newsletter about alternative investment. And there's a course on alternative assets and private market that's available. Thanks a lot for watching and stay tuned because I'm not done yet with private equity. And if you have comments, if you have questions, if you disagree with me, please let me know in the comments below the video. Thank you very much.